Man, that's uh, that's really exhilarating being on the other side of that. I'll tell, I'll tell you what. Um, how are you guys doing? Good. Yeah. How was spring break? You feel? Yeah. Do you feel? Do you feel rested and like ready to tackle the rest of the semester? Were you just like dying to come back to school? No. No. Maybe. Okay. Let's get a couple. That's good. Yeah. Dying for challenge. There we go. Yes. I'm excited to be back here tonight. Um, I am so excited to be able to wrap up our series on James tonight. Um, each chapter and message that we've heard so far has been packed full of biblical truth that is super relevant to our lives today. And I hope that in wrapping up tonight, you feel all better equipped with the wisdom to live and act out our faith. So let me pray for us before we get started. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the opportunity that we get to know your word, God. The opportunity that we get to come before you in worship and community tonight. I pray that you would just be in the midst of everything that I say, God, that you would direct my words, God, and I pray that you would help us to understand what you want us to, God, I'm confident that you have something for all of us tonight. And so, Lord, we thank you again, and I pray that you would just be with us, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so James, in writing to the 12 tribes of Jewish Christians, right, as we learned at the beginning, finishes his letter by speaking about one of the most important spiritual disciplines, prayer, right? That's what he finishes his letter with, so it must be kind of important. So through, through the Holy Spirit, James writes about the power of prayer and the heart posture that we should take as we approach praying and the importance of being open and honest with others as it relates to our prayer. I think it's really important to remember the magnificent gift that it is to pray, right? This is the opportunity that we have to communicate with the creator and upholder of the universe. Like in any given moment, we can talk to him. That's pretty cool. So prayer is our direct communication with him that reflects our abiding in him. It isn't treating God as our personal and spiritual vending machine, as some of us, like I've been tempted to do at times, but it's so much more than that. Like we're called to bring our requests to him, but like I said, it's more than that. Timothy Keller says in his book titled Prayer, the Apostle Paul does not see prayer as merely a way to get things from God, but as a way to get more of God himself. Prayer is a striving to take hold of God. I love that. Prayer is truly much more than we're tempted to think it is. It is a means of growing in all the things previously mentioned in James, right? We're unable to escape our sinful patterns without the help of the Holy Spirit, so why would we not pray for him to help us? So let's jump in and look at what James 5 has to say about Christ's followers in prayer. So starting in verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being as we were, as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced its fruit. So here's our first point. Pray righteously. Pray righteously. So going back, James writes in verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now what I want to do first is focus on that last part. What does it mean to be righteous? How does that affect our prayer? And what is this verse actually saying? So if we look at scripture, we can see clearly that our prayers can be hindered by sin in our lives. I want to make the distinction and say that Christ, through his accomplished work on the cross, has made us righteous before God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through Jesus, we are justified and have been made righteous in standing before God. So what is this verse talking about? God only listens if I'm not sinning? Does he not listen at all if I sin? Not necessarily. There's some important things to know as we approach this. If God only answered our prayer based on the fact that I never sin, none of my prayers would be answered, right? I, I am a sinner. We're all sinners, right? No one here is without sin. So like I said before, we can't think about this as black and white as we're tempted to. So I want to first point to a great example of going to God in the midst of our sin. King David is in anguish over the wrong that he's committed, and yet he goes to God in prayer. 
So in Psalm 51, verses one and two, David writes, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Oftentimes after we sin in some capacity and we fall, we're tempted to take a time out from God. That's a very natural thing. It's like, I can't, I can't even bear to be around. I can't even think about it. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not good. Right. Like I said before, like we can go to God in our sin. We need to make sure that we run to him for forgiveness in the event of our sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So go to God in prayer, no matter where you are. That, that needs to be clear first. So now looking back to James 5.16, he said that the prayers of a righteous person are power, powerful and effective. So James is referring to a fact that a heart and mind not pursuing holiness and a righteous lifestyle will oftentimes not see many answered prayers. John Piper says it well in an article that he wrote. He said, the person whose prayers are not answered is not the person who fights against temptation now and then loses the battle, but the person who is quite content with his spiritual mediocrity and makes no effort to improve or to overcome his lethargy and carnality. Therefore, never say, I must be perfect in order to have my prayers answered. It's important to know. God cares about our holiness. He cares about the way that we live our lives, right? Jesus didn't die for us just for God to say, cool, all right, see you later. It's not what happened, right? And like David mentioned a couple weeks ago, God is not our genie, right? Like a parent who disciplines their child, God will not give you the things that he knows will take his place. The scripture gives us examples of him asking us our obedience. The psalmist, again, gives a picture of their own experience in Psalm 66, verses 18 through 20. He says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. We must not cherish sin in our hearts. Right? That's, that's the important part right there. So James even wrote of this earlier in his letter in chapter four, verse three, saying, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. This reminded me of a situation uh, when I was younger. Um, as I entered middle school, I wanted so badly to get social media. I feel like that was the time Snapchat and Instagram were like really starting to, to kick off, you know? I wanted so bad, I begged my parents to get it because they kind of had you know, control over what, what I was doing on devices and stuff. But they said no. And as a young kid, like, it did not make sense why. Everyone else was getting it. What the heck, you know? Like that was kind of frustrating. But that, my parents did not see it the way I saw it. They, being in a different point in life, knowing more than I knew at that time, knew that a seventh grader downloading and joining social media would, might do more harm than good, right? So because they loved me and cared for me, they said no. But, you know, in my 11-year-old wisdom, I could not see the danger that lay ahead, so I was just mad. <laughs> I was just upset. So in love, my parents withheld something that I desired. Now, as an adult who understands the psychological effect that social media can have on young children, like, I'm grateful that they didn't just let me go to town on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, is, is God not more knowing than us? Is he not in a different place? Does he not know more? Right? He's all-powerful and omniscient. He sees exactly what happens if we get what we want. So he withholds things for our good and his glory. Right? That's important. The awesome thing, too, is that God invites us to abide in him and know him better. And then we get the privilege of knowing what he desires in the way that he designed the world. And this is what will often happen as we seek to grow closer to God. We're still sinners in the process of being redeemed, but as we abide in him, our thoughts and desires begin to mirror his. A heart yielded to God will see the answer to prayer because our wants become his wants. Our hopes become his hopes, right? The work of the Holy Spirit in us will cause a change from that of sinful desires to godly desires. And I love this. Psalm 37, four says, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in him in his character, in his goodness. Let your heart be continually made in his likeness and see that he will give you what you ask for. So we have to remember too that 
obedience to God doesn't earn us merit as it relates to our prayer. Our obedience should always be motivated by the mercy and love God showed us on the cross. So pray righteously, right? Repent, pursue a lifestyle of righteousness. And flee sin, as the Bible says, and let the grace of God motivate our obedience that God may hear our prayers and glorify himself by answering them. So now let's jump back to the first part of James 5.16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. So I think that understanding this previous point is vital to understanding this next one. So our next point is pray in community. Pray in community. So us confessing to one another is not tied to our salvation. I want that to be clear. Like that's, that's not what James is saying right here. Remember, by grace alone, we have been saved through faith. Confession to other believers is not necessary for us to be forgiven by God, but, but it is so important. And there is serious spiritual renewal and healing that comes as we live openly and honestly with others. God did not design Christian living to be marked by secrecy. It's, it's, that's not how he designed it. Ephesians 5 speaks of this when Paul writes in verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That's really cool. That's a cool verse. Right? It's clear that there is great power in taking what is done in secret, like even by us <laughs> and exposing it. Paul writes that it actually becomes light. That's cool. What a cool picture of God taking what we mess up with and using it to glorify himself, right? If we're willing to be open and bring it into light. So like Paul says, have no part in the deeds of darkness, right? Instead, expose them. So one thing we must realize too is we're all sinners, like I said before. And since none of us have achieved perfection, it's correct to say that we will probably sin again, right? We're not just gonna be, I'm not gonna leave this room and be like, I got it. I'm good. You know, that's not, that's not what's going to happen. So when we do, when we inevitably fall into sin, we need to be swift and purposeful after the fact. Don't sit in shame and, and wallow in your shortcomings and be like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I messed up. I'm just the worst. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Rather, confess to God. Run to him. Run to him quick. And be swift in your confession to others as well, because life gets very hard when we live in the dark. I think about that. I, I've definitely experienced this. That, And I think Brian mentioned this when he spoke on James 3 a couple of weeks ago. It's like I was struggling with something and I confessed to God and I repented, but I just couldn't shake it. It's like beating my head against a wall. I don't know what was going on. But as soon as you open up to someone about it and ask for help, man, the weight is lifted. Oh my gosh. It makes sense. That's the way that God designed us to live. Like, we should, we should do that, right? And now think about what life is living like in the dark. Like think about something. Maybe right now, maybe something in your past. I know I felt this. It's miserable. As Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in us too, and he convicts us. So we really clearly feel the weight of our sin. In Psalm 32, the writer gives us an image into what living in unconfessed sin is like. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, in this verse, it's talking specifically about confessing to God, which is first priority. That you need to do. But I truly believe that it applies to this context as well as we open up to other believers. That verse has been incredibly helpful for me in thinking about the importance of opening up to others. God has used that a lot. So it's clear that secrecy as a whole, living and hiding in the things we struggle with is a recipe for misery. It's hard. The weight is really heavy. Scripture is very clear that isolating ourselves from others and God in the midst of struggles is wrong and ultimately harmful. Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Going further away from others allows for a sense of pride to seep into how we view life. And as verse 
as this verse states, we begin to break out against all sound judgment. So what he's saying is that like, it's only gonna get harder and harder and harder and harder, right? That's the importance of being quick about it because the shame's gonna stack up and it's gonna be hard. So that's why go quick to others and be open. There's serious danger in living in darkness with our sins. Something that can, uh, in nature that can serve as a representation of this relationship between, is the relationship between wolves and their prey. Some of you might've heard this before, but wolves will often attempt to isolate a single member of the herd that they've been stalking or hunting. Um, if they can get it alone, it's an easy kill, right? This is the same for us. Living in a place of isolation where we have no brothers or sisters to help us pursue righteousness, we make ourselves an easy target for the enemy. Right? We open ourselves up to attack, right? You're gonna to be told that like you don't deserve like the friendships that you have. You like these lies are gonna get worse, right? And it's gonna get hard. So oh, this is a this is a phrase that stuck with me for a long time, and maybe some of you have heard me say it before, but a lone ranger is a dead ranger. That just man, that was rent free up there. A lone ranger is a dead ranger, right? We're built for community. That's the way God designed us. So through Christ, we are free of the sins that enslaved us. Like the jail door has been opened, right? And so since we're slaves to them no longer, we can walk out. Therefore, we can bring them before God and trusted fellow believers knowing that there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation and that spiritual healing can come. We see a picture of confessing being a result of a transformed life in Matthew 3. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus' arrival as the Messiah and preaching repentance. And as people were getting baptized, Matthew writes in verse 6, and they were baptized in the river, confessing their sins. So we see here that the fruit of a life that is like repenting is that of being open and honest and confessing our sins to others, right? Because that's how God designed healing to come. A life that is being sanctified and renewed by the Holy Spirit cannot take sin lightly, right? God has designed Christian living in a way that makes being open and honest a crucial part of the sanctification process, right? Of us being made in Christ's likeness. This doesn't mean that you need to share with everyone you come into contact with, right? I'm not going to come up like, all right, guys, like in front of challenge, I'm just going to like, this is what I'm struggling with. No, that's not what I'm saying. Rather, it means that we should embrace an open and honest lifestyle that reflects a life wholly transformed by the gospel. Since he has paid for our sin, we can go to a few trusted and close believers with sincerity, trusting that God will first use the confession process to heal us spiritually, sometimes physically, honestly, and but also, he will also foster a deeper and more genuine relationships with, with those who we're in community with. That's another awesome part of this. I've experienced this in my own life. Like Psalm 32 said, I felt myself wasting away when I kept silent. I'm like, I feel that. <laughs> I was scared to open up about like a consistent issue that I was struggling with. But through God's mercy and his leading, I opened up about it. Not only was the burden on my shoulders lifted, but my relationship with these few people was deepened in a way that I never could have expected. Very quickly became some of my closest brothers. And that catalyst was being open and honest about what I was struggling with. Believe it or not too, a lie that you'll probably hear is that you're the only one that struggles with that. That's not true. That's so not true. That is a lie. Because what you'll find is that as you open up to other people, like, man, yeah, I've, I've been struggling with that too. Thank you for being open about that. I, like, let's help each other. That, that will happen, I promise. You are not the only one struggling with whatever you're struggling with, okay? So, and this is what community is for, right? Even being at Challenge tonight, that's a great start, you know? This is what the church is for. Having a family of believers that can lift each other up and remind each other of the great gift of God's forgiveness, Right? So open up with what you're struggling with to one or two trusted individuals and challenge. This is what discipleship is for, the discipleship relationship, right? Growing, learning, and cultivating an open and honest lifestyle. Trust me, it is so freeing. And as we root out the sin in our lives, our hearts will be made more like him and therefore more obedient to what he's called us to. Live in the light. Pray in community. Okay? So with these two points in mind, 
how else should we pray? What else does he say? Let's look at what James continues with in chapter five, starting in verse 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens and the heaven gained rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So our next point, pray expectantly. Pray expectantly. All right, so I want to look at the phrase, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What does that mean? What's the significance of that? I think it's kind of a big deal that James included this fact into his example of how we should pray. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I find for myself in reading about some of the Old Testament prophets, and Elijah was one in, in 1 Kings, um, I'll subconsciously set them on a higher level, right? They're like the hero of the Old Testament that was just so much more holy and powerful than I ever could be. This verse says otherwise, right? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. <laughs> a fundamental truth that we need to know is that the heroes of the Old Testament were powerful only to the extent that they had faith, they had faith in God. They had faith in the God of Israel, the creator of the universe, to do what he promised. There's an entire chapter in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, called the Hall of Faith, right? Describing the characters of the Old Testament doing great things through their faith in God. Scripture actually gives us insight into Elijah's humanity in 1 Kings 19. And this is after some pretty crazy things have happened, so you should go and read the story. But 1 Kings 19 says, he, and he prayed that he might die, saying, is it, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Wow. The very man that had just called down fire from heaven to envelop a water-soaked altar to just humiliate the false prophets of Baal, asking God to end his life, right? He didn't see the success of what he did the way that he had hoped. Like God didn't maybe didn't answer the prayer that he had prayed right then and there. And so this feeling, right, this coming to terms with our own fragility and weakness should be a familiar one, right? We, this is part of life, right? We can't do it. We need God. So this prophet had faith that God would do great things, but was also sinful and broken. So Elijah, a human just like us, with all of our issues and faults and sins, prayed a pretty big prayer, and God answered him, right, that it wouldn't rain for three years, so we as Christ followers should pray according to his will, expecting him to answer, despite where we're at in life. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Like I mentioned earlier, as we pursue holiness and right living, our desires begin to align with God's. Like We can expect God to respond because our prayers echo his desires. The word that Jesus uses is abide. And the original Greek word used is miniate. And this translates to obviously abide, but remain, dwell, to be held and kept. I love that one. He specifically says that we are not to only abide in him, but also his words in us. Now this means that we should be in the process of being molded in his likeness. We should let what the Bible says and what he said in the Bible just soak up every part of who we are right? Abiding in Christ means letting his word fill our minds, direct our wills, and transform our affections. This is what I mentioned in the first point. Like, this is the reason that this verse says that we can pray expectantly, which is so cool. So in all this, we should fight the urge to doubt as well, because this is something that's very natural. This will come up as we seek to pray big prayers for God. We can choose to have faith because of the great truth that I just talked about. In James 1, 6 through 7, he says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Dang. This points to a great unease that comes from praying from a place of doubt rather than faith. Right? Being able to pray expectantly means we trust God to fully come through on his promises. One of my favorite stories from the life of Jesus is when he's walking on water and he calls Peter out of the boat to him. So Peter gets out of the boat in the midst of a storm and is walking to him, but he begins to look around and see 
there's a storm around me. Like, what? How, how am I doing this too? So he begins to sink. And as he's sinking, he cries out, Lord, help me. And so Jesus reaches out, he takes his hand, pulls him up, and he says these words, and this has stuck with me for a long time. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? All right, doubt has no purpose except to keep us from trusting God and praying big prayers. And now as we begin to make a habit of praying expectantly, we have to make sure that we understand the difference between presumption and faith, asking in faith. The Gospel of Luke gives a great insight into a faith-focused, expectant request in chapter 5, verse 12. It says, while he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus, fell face down, and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he does. Jesus re responds and says, indeed, I am willing, and heals him. Notice the words that the leper chooses as he asks Jesus to be healed. He says, if you are willing, he doesn't approach Jesus and demand that he heal him. He doesn't demand it. He, in faith, first believes that Jesus can heal him. He says, you can make me well. But then, in humility, he asks to be healed. He says, if you are willing, Lord. So as we pray, let us ask the Lord humbly, right? Let us not presume on what he will do. We can trust him to accomplish his purposes in our lives, no matter what it might look like. Because it might look differently than you expect. And so Psalm 5, verse 3 says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. That'd be a good one to memorize. Let our hearts mirror the posture of King David as he wrote this. Let us continually seek to ask big things of God according to his will that he may answer. How would your life look tomorrow if you started praying expectantly today? How would it be different? How could prayer and making a habit of it grow you closer to God? How could it strengthen your faith? Think about these things. In the world today too, it's so easy to pray a prayer and totally miss if it's answered. Like we're just like, God, I really need help with this. Would you help me? Okay, on to the next thing. And then we just forget. Maybe he answered it. I don't know. I wasn't looking, <laughs> right? So be aware, right? Be in step with God. Be consistently walking with him so that you could see where he's answering prayers. Because like I said before, it might not be the way that you expect it, right? That's the beauty of it, is that we can ask in faith knowing that he will answer even if we don't see how, right? Right? He might answer a prayer that I have today, 50, 60 years from now. Who knows? Maybe after I'm gone, right? But I, I can know that he will accomplish his will and his purpose, right? So keep that in mind. And so these truths in this text, text show just how powerful prayer can be and the importance of it, right? This is how James chose to wrap up his letter. This is the last one of the last things he says. But it's easy to misunderstand, obviously. Again, God isn't your genie. It's not your vending machine. You don't just like do life and then, mm, I'm kind of hungry. I could, hey God, can I get like, mm, just energy today? Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, sweet. <laughs> like, come on, it's more than that, right? It's a means in which we get to strive after God and know him. He's not gonna give you the things that will become idols in your life. Keep that in mind too. But as Jesus said, when we abide in him and his words in us, we can ask anything and it will be done for us. Charles Spurgeon said this about prayer. Prayer is the natural outgushing of a soul in communion with Jesus. Just as the leaf and the fruit will come out of the vine branch without any conscious effort on part of the branch, but simply because of its living union with the stem, so prayer buds and blossoms and fruits out of souls abiding in Jesus. Some really cool imagery right there. So in our lives, not only should we repent, right, for God, but confess to others. We pursue a life of holiness because God has paid the highest price for us, and that's what we're motivated by. We look to the great mercy shown by Christ on the cross and are moved to obedience out of a love and thankfulness for him. 
he made a way to come before him where there was none before. And as we grow, we can continually expect him to answer us because his word is changing us to be like him. So know what he says. Go and study the word. What are his promises? Figure that out. And pray earnestly while seeking to live a righteous, open, and honest life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today. God, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come before you, God, in worship and prayer. God, I thank you for prayer. I thank you for just the opportunity that we get to, to talk to you and ask you, God. I thank you that we can trust you to continually make us like you as we seek to live righteously and open, God. I pray that you would give each and every one of us the strength and the courage to trust you as we open up to others. God, I pray that you would just bring healing as we all seek to adopt this into our lives, God. So we love you, Lord, and we pray that you would be glorified through all these things, God. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.